Um, and uh, I, I guess I wanted to introduce today's session by just saying a couple of brief things. One, uh, one is this: that we've uh, we've been running this for uh, this series for a couple of years now. And as all of you who've been coming are aware, so far we've had academics come and present new research on issues related to local governance, municipal governance, urban governance, and politics. Um, and in the last few months, I've been getting requests from a variety of people to integrate an element of practitioners into our series as well, so, uh, so that we have a perspective of, from people who actually you know, work in the field rather than just study it. So, uh, uh, so we're going to start doing that, and, and I'm very glad to uh, welcome today Jennifer Smout. Um, and Jen is a solicitor with the City of London. Um, she focuses on municipal law, licensing, privacy law, and corporate governance. And she actually recently returned to working for the city after about five years of working as an adjudicator for the OMB. Um, and uh, Jen is also an adjunct prof at uh, Western's Law School. And as many of you know, um, she teaches in our program. I'm happy to have her as part of the team who teaches municipal law in our MPA program. And Jen's going to be speaking to us today about some recent critical cases in municipal law. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Martin. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming today, both uh, here at uh, Western University in person and uh, everyone else that's online out there in cyberspace joining us today. Um, I, do, I want to start my talk, uh, because I am a lawyer, we always have to have a little bit of a legal disclaimer at the beginning of, of the talk. And, and my disclaimer is, is that my, my discussion today are my views and my own views. They're not the views of uh, the uh, City of London or the uh, London uh, City Council, uh, and I just uh, wanted to be sure that we know that. So now that uh, we've sufficiently covered that, I was going to give you a waiver to sign, but then I thought, well, we would be okay with that since I know many of you here today. <laughs> Um, I, I spoke with Martin about this some time ago because I thought it might be helpful just to have a discussion about some cases that uh, have cropped up in the municipal uh, law area. Not so much so that you get the nitty gritty detail of the legal nuances or principles in these cases, but I was hoping more today to convey to you a message of why these cases are important in my view for maybe some of the work that you do. Uh, as uh, political scientists, and, and perhaps uh, more specifically, just uh, as they relate to uh, public policy and the public policy process. So I have uh, three themes today on, under uh, on, uh, that I'm going to cover. And the first thing is just uh, about the new Municipal Act legislation, which although we still call it the new Municipal Act, is now seven years old. So uh, some cases that are showing us or demonstrating to us that this legislation is working as planned. It does take a long time for cases to work their way through the system and for people to get familiar with new legislation and try new things. And so we are starting to see in the last two to three years we've been starting to see more cases uh, in interpreting and applying the legislation or challenging what the powers are. And I think in some respects you're going to see that it is working as planned. I've got a few cases that I call are things that are on the horizon. They're out there uh, looming. They've either been decided and appealed, or they're just in the mill. Uh, the cases have just started, and they haven't been argued, and there hasn't been a decision yet. And then um, at the last uh, area that I wanted to talk are just some of the growing pains that we have with this legislation. Um, some people might think that some things in the legislation have created a bit of a collision course. I don't know if I go that far, but uh, we're certainly having some trouble wrestling some of these uh, new provisions and these new powers, and I thought I'd talk about those. Uh, I did have a handout that's at the corner here. Uh, it's just a list of the, ca the cases that I am going to speak about, and so I know that after the lecture, all the students are going to go to Canley and look up all those cases and, and read them all, and, and I know all the professors in the room have read them all already in, in any of that, so, but it's there in case you, you do need it. So the first case I want to talk about is the Eng case in Toronto, and that was Toronto's bylaw um, with respect to shark finning and banning shark fins. Uh, this case, there are two key points I think that you need to, to know about this case and why I think it's important for you. Uh, the first is, is that it examines the scope of these municipal broad powers and the new broad powers that came into the legislation in 2007. 
And secondly, it gives us just a little bit of insight in terms of uh, how difficult it is becoming to challenge municipal bylaws under the new legislation. So firstly, in terms of the broad powers, that was the key component of the Municipal Act in 2007, enhancing all these powers to municipalities. We're now big governments, we can govern as we see fit, and uh, we can do a lot more rather than just what's prescribed. And we have a little more freedom in terms of how we do it. So hopefully allowing governments to develop local solutions for local issues and tackle it from that perspective. Um, Section 10 is the, uh, the, the broad power that uh, allows municipalities to uh, regulate or pass bylaws related to any service or thing that the municipality considers necessary or desirable for the public. So I think we know what a service is, so what constitutes a thing under the legislation, I think is still out there. Um, but and many of us in our, my municipal colleagues, we have to joke about that, well, what would a legal thing be? But, but uh, there it is. <coughs> and when you're applying these broad powers, there was, I think, some school of thought, perhaps not so much from the legal minds, but from the policy perspective, that this new power really set the, the framework for the sky to be the limit. In other words, as long as it's necessary, desirable for the public, it's okay, go ahead, municipality, and get in there and, and start to do what you want to do. And this case clearly says no. There's a check on that, and really what you have to ensure is, is that the bylaw you are passing or the activity that you are regulating or action you are taking has to be for a municipal purpose, and it has to be a valid municipal purpose. And that's the check here. And now the end decision when you read this case, um, it's a little difficult to read. It, it does have some good uh, points in it, but it's not organized as well as perhaps some other decisions that we've seen from the court. And as you wade through the case, this will come to bear uh, mostly near the uh, middle of the decision. So what the court says, just in a nutshell, is that this does not mean that an issue is a municipal issue merely because a policy decision is taken by the council, um, that an issue is important and it's desirable. There has to be something more than that. And so in this case, the court says there's nothing to suggest that the offensive practice of sharp thinning in distant oceans uh, affected the ability of Torontonians to live together as an urban community. So there wasn't really that connection or that nexus between the purpose of the bylaw and whether or not it was a valid municipal purpose. Um, the courts also speak about this power in terms of being unlimited uh, and, and whether or not all the council has to do is just state that it's desirable uh, to take municipal action isn't sufficient because if that were the case, the determination of the scope of the municipal powers would just be solely of a matter for the council to decide. And I think that's consistent with what the legislature is saying. You can have these powers, you pick and choose what it is that you want to exercise and how you want to exercise those powers, but there better be a municipal purpose for it because you still really are the creature of the statute. The second thing that comes out of this case is that it does demonstrate that challenging bylaws is becoming a little bit more difficult. Uh, in the previous 1990 version and 2003 version of the Municipal Act, there were a lot more avenues that just made it a little easier to attack a bylaw and have it struck. Um, but in this case, uh, really I think the courts are demonstrating to us that bylaws attract a strong presumption of validity in that case. So it's becoming a little bit more difficult. So there's now, the second case I'd like to speak about is the 221126 Ontario Inc. and the City of Brantford. And in every municipal law talk, you always have to have a discussion about an adult live entertainment parlor or a strip club, because those are usually the ones with the most interesting facts and uh, whatever. So, so this is your strip club case for today. Now, Martin, you see really what goes on in our, in, in our municipal law class. But uh, in any event, um, this case has two key points for you that demonstrate, in my view, the legislation is working. The first is, is that it supports the broad application of licensing powers <coughs> under the Municipal Act and how they've been broadened out by this legislation. And the second is, is that it deals with the municipality's powers in its bylaw to differentiate as it sees fit, which was a big change in the legislation. 
So it, uh, firstly, in terms of the municipality's licensing powers, um, the definition of licensing is broadened out in the Act now. And so licensing does not just mean business licensing in the traditional sense anymore. So think of things like uh, restaurants and taxis and, and uh, live entertainment parlors and other types of businesses that municipalities regulate. The definition for licensing is much broader and it also includes a permit, an approval, uh, a registration or any other type of permission and licensing has a corresponding meaning. So what that means is you can now have a licensing system that you would have traditionally used for business licensing in terms of regulating activities and apply it to this whole other group of, and I'm going to use that term, things. Um, and, and that definition blows it much, much wider. So municipalities are starting to use this, but there hasn't been, I don't think, as much of an uptake at this point as we expected. So this case looks at the section uh, in the Municipal Act, and for my students it's 151 sub 5. And that says that you can impose a system of licenses with respect to any activity, matter, or thing as if it were a system of licenses with respect to a business. In other words, you can broaden it out much, much more, and you'd rely on that definition. And this case, although it doesn't hinge entirely on that point, it does make these references to it, and I think it clarifies that for us, that you're okay to move into that field and to do that. I think the most important thing that comes out of this case is, is that it looks at Section 8, Sub 4 of the Municipal Act. And that is the, the power, and I'll read it to you just because I don't know how familiar you are, are with it. But it, it says that a bylaw under the Act may be general or specific in its application, and it may differentiate in any way and on any basis a municipality considers appropriate. Now the word is differentiate, it's not discriminate. So if your bylaw does not comply with the Human Rights Code or offends something in the Charter, that would be discriminatory and you'd have a problem there. But it allows you to differentiate. And there had been a case down in Windsor, it's called Silver's Lounge, and Windsor, under the 2003 version of the Act, had attempted to license adult entertainers, people that were working, I think it was the dancers, working in these, in these uh, facilities, establishments. And the court concluded that the municipality wasn't able to do that. And, they, and it held that a bylaw which re required employees who performed their duties in the nude or partially nude um, that did not extend to other employees who performed the same duties but were clothed. So whether the bartender is naked or whether the bartender is clothed. That would constitute a discrimination and was not permitted under the previous version of the Act. Well this case looked at the same point, whether or not Brantford could license its entertainers. And there are lots of legal nuances in the case, but the policy point is simply this is that yes, the court recognizes this change in the legislation and says you can do that, you can differentiate between entertainers that are clothed and entertainers that are not. Uh, in the lower court decision there is some discussion about whether you can only regulate the bylaw regulating only women who are topless and not men and that was struck for being discriminatory into that case, the Jacobs case some time ago, the woman who wanted to proceed in a public place uh, topless. So. That case came back and found its way in the back door through there. So uh, in that respect, I, I think that widens up the powers for municipalities in terms of how the bylaws apply and who they apply to. And it, that's clearly, in my view, what the intent of the legislation was. Third case I want to talk about, this is not a new case, it's a 2012 case, and it's the Friends of Lansdowne and the Ottawa case. Uh, I think it's an important case because it is a case about the Ottawa Public-Private Partnership to redevelop a, a, a park uh, in Ottawa. And this is something that municipalities are doing across the province. They are entering and are embarking uh, on arrangements, sometimes with other municipalities, sometimes with private sector park partners. And they are doing projects which hopefully will stimulate some type of development or uh, provide facilities they don't have maybe attract new people, maybe attract new business. And it's very, very popular right now. And with money being tight, these types of arrangements are surfacing all over the place. And Lansdowne looks at one of those, uh, those uh, proposals. 
There are three important points that come out of Lansdowne from a policy perspective. And I think the first is it looks at the bonusing aspect, what municipalities can or can't do when they enter into these arrangements, and provides uh, some clarification. I might want to put that in quotation marks. The second is it looks at these Section 270 policies in the Municipal Act. And it used to be under the old Municipal Act that everything you did was very prescriptive. And so rules for even how you sold land was all prescribed. Those things all came out of the 2007 version of the Act. And instead, it was replaced with Section 270 that says to municipalities, you shall, and it's a mandatory shall, have policies that deal with six things. And one of them is the disposition of land. One is procurement of goods. Uh, there's others with respect to accountability, transparency, employment, and, and public notice. But it left it to the municipalities to set up their own policies and processes for how they were going to do it. So the question I think that many of us are wondering about those 270 policies is what's the effect of those? You have to have them. How far do you have to follow them? And the third thing that comes out of the Ottawa case is an interesting use of one of their accountability uh, transparency officers, their Auditor General. And we see more of a proactive use of the Auditor General as opposed to a reactive use. So in terms of the bonusing, that's Section 106 in the Municipal Act. And in short, municipalities can't assist directly or indirectly a manufacturing business or an industrial or commercial enterprise through the granting of a bonus. And so the problem with this case, with this section has always been bonus is never defined. And so what is a bonus? And the Court of Appeal looks at this issue. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Friends of Lansdowne had a website and I was following it throughout this litigation and they had a lot of interesting arguments and things that were posted on the website about their position on, on the bonus. And to some extent, uh, some of it was very compelling and I think uh, it, it really made this case worthy of consideration by the court. I looked last night and I didn't see all of that posted there. So I was uh, going to give you the link for that, but I didn't see as much posted uh, there. So I, I'm, I'm sorry that that's now gone. But in any event, the question really is, what is a bonus? And the, the Court of Appeal follows some other jurisprudence, some from British Columbia and also some from Ontario, and concludes that it really means an obvious advantage. So, and I can see everyone nodding, that settles it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had a choice between going into political science or law, and you, you know, when when I when I get a statement like that, I, I kind of think maybe the other route might have been a bit easier. I don't know, but in any event, an obvious advantage, as it's discussed in this case, is is on a spectrum of benefits, falls closer to providing a party with uh, um, a, a, an unmerited uh, windfall. So does that help us a little bit more? Well, I think so. It's saying, you know, there really has to be something egregious out there for it to, to qualify. So the test is not whether or not the municipality made a good deal. The test is whether there is this obvious advantage. And so this, this case just affirms all of the past jurisprudence that uh, there'll be no obvious advantage where there's a complicated or a complex matrix of covenants flowing between the parties. So in other words, if the deal is structured so that there's give and take on both sides, they both have to do certain things, have obligations or responsibilities, that there's some risk shared, uh, and that you look at the deal as a whole, not just one or two parts of it, that there's this balancing act between how everything is apportioned then that's going to be good enough to meet the test, that it will not be a bonus. And so in other words, really what you're looking for is that one party isn't getting something for nothing. Um, and again, it's clear in this decision that you have to look at the arrangement as a whole. You can't zero in just on one aspect of the transaction or one aspect of the deal. So the fact that maybe the, the land is being leased at a nominal consideration or transferred at a nominal consideration 
what are the other factors that come along to, and come into play? So for instance, if the property had a building on it maybe that had to be demolished and that was going to be quite expensive, then that might be a, a benefit to the city and therefore some reason for conveying it out in that aspect. Um, What's also uh, interesting about this case is the lower court decision, uh, Justice Hackland, he makes specific mention in that decision that there is an increased importance in these public-private partnerships. And I think the courts have really recognized that as well. Uh, they're important to establish municipal facilities. I think these types of arrangements are here to stay. And uh, by their nature, they're going to be very, very complex arrangements. And this Ottawa one certainly was. Um, and there will be this exchange of benefits and obligations back and forth in order to facilitate the development. So some places I think that prior to Lansdowne that were a little nervous about getting into these arrangements, I think see that as an opportunity that provided you do it the right way, you're going to be okay. Um, what is clear from these definitions as we have is that you'll, you're going to have to look at each one of these deals on a case-by-case -case basis. You're going to have to weigh them very carefully to make sure that you haven't offended that uh, provision in the Act. So in terms of the Section 270 policies, Ottawa had some policies that dealt in some respects not exactly right on point with this type of a transaction. And really I'm going to parse this down for you in the interest of time. They didn't follow those rules exactly. They picked a different process. And so the question now is, well, you had this policy and you didn't follow it, therefore what you did wasn't in compliance with the policy and your bylaw should be struck. And, and the court concludes that that's just a technical failure. Kind of reminds me of the, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean when they're rowing in the boat and she says, well, it's just a guideline, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, so, you know but it's a technical failure uh, to invoke the policy, but it was addressed because of the detailed process that the city followed when they went through reviewing this proposal and approving this proposal. So effectively what would have been accomplished under the policy was accomplished another way and therefore it was okay. So I think that provides some guidance to us because sometimes your policy, it may not be a one-size-fits-all transaction and so it gives you a little bit of flexibility in terms of how you deal with these things. Um, the last is the role of the Auditor General. And uh, again, in my view, this is the proactive use of the accountability officer as opposed to reactive. You're not bringing them in to look at something when there's been an eyebrow raised or some type of scandal on the front page of the paper. In effect, they use the Ottawa General in this instance to review this proposal, provide an independent review, and in particular looked at the revenue distributions, one of the key financial aspects that some people were uncomfortable with just on the face of it. And so it's a different use of an auditor and there are some uh, uh, practitioners out there and scholars who believe that the use of these accountability and transparency officers can also provide some type of protection to a municipality. That they're not just the protection to the public in terms of looking at what the municipality has done, but also can help guide the, uh, the Municipal Council in terms of making the proper decision. So in terms of some cases that are on the horizon, I've got, I've got a series of them here. Uh, it seems every time I do a lecture, I wake up in the morning and I listen to the CBC and they're talking about something and I get so angry. Couldn't they have held that story till tomorrow because they stole my thunder. So, so if you listen to the CBC today, you can just ignore what I have to say for the next couple of minutes and eat your sandwich. But uh, I wanted to talk about the Bedford case and, and that's the common body houses of uh, living off the avails of prostitution, communicating for the purposes of prostitution. So we know what happened in that case, 2013, and there's a year till the end of the year for uh, new legislation to, to come into force and effect. And so what is going to happen, we don't know. But um, if, if you heard the, uh, the news today, there's some concern by people in the sex, uh, sex workers and in the, in the sex uh, industry business that you have to be careful how the government, the government's going to have to be careful how they regulate this because um, there are pros and cons of doing it in certain ways. And so depending on what the federal government does, uh, it, it could impact municipalities. Uh, if, for instance, they take a hands-off approach, 
then um, this is the type of thing, going back to the Bramford case I talked about earlier, that perhaps maybe municipalities are going to have to look at regulating. So would that be through official plan and zoning amendments for the location of uh, businesses? How would these be considered home occupations? I don't know. I, you know. I don't know the answers to this. Would you be looking at licensing people working in these, in these industries as well? And what would their requirements be? Now there's examples in other jurisdictions how that's been done. But uh, I think everyone's waiting to, uh, to hear about that. Uh, the second case I wanted to talk about is the Serpent River First Nation and Elliott Lake case. And this is a, on a completely different topic. It's about uh, whether municipal governments have a duty to consult with First Nations uh, under Section 35 of the Charter. And so there are a series of cases coming out of the Supreme Court of Canada. The key one is the Delgamuk case. Uh, if you can say that five times quick. Then uh, I guess you get sad. Watch it. <laughs> but uh, it, it, in any event, um, what comes out of these cases very quickly is is that the crown uh, has an obligation to consult with First Nations uh, when their conduct may or uh, or proposed conduct or or a conduct that they are exercising may interfere or have an adverse or potential uh, impact on an Aboriginal or a treaty right. So an Aboriginal right might be something like the right to fish, hunt, and gather, uh, uses of lands for ceremonial uh, purposes, perhaps for hunting, perhaps as a passageway to a hunting ground, uh, etc. So in, in a nutshell, Aboriginal rights are constitutionally protected by Section 35. They're not absolute. The government can infringe upon them, uh, provided they can justify the infringement. But they have to consult with the First Nations, and that consultation must be meaningful. And they also, as part of the consultation, have to look at mechanisms to perhaps accommodate the right. So the scope and the and the and the, the conduct of the duty uh, or the content of the duty to uh, consult really uh, depends on the nature of the claim, the seriousness of the infringement, or the or the uh, adverse effect as well. And technically, the duty to consult cannot be delegated from the Crown to someone else. What you can do is, is delegate some of the procedural aspects of, of going through the, through the consultation. So originally, it was held that the federal government had the duty to consult. It's the honor of the Crown, and that's where it resides. After Delgamuk, there were a series of cases considered by the Supreme Court, and that duty filtered down to the province as well. And so really, the question is, who's next? And is it municipal governments? Or will we have this duty or won't we? And there was a case in Salmon Arm back in 2012 where the British Columbia Court of Appeal said no municipalities do not have a duty to consult. This case in Elliott Lake is currently before the courts. And it, it did involve a, uh, an application by uh, the Economic Development Corporation in Elliott Lake to do, uh, I think it was a subdivision on, on some lands. And it involved some lands where uh, an Aboriginal right was claimed. And so there was some modification, as I understand, to take certain lands out. And Elliott Lake uh, very quickly, uh, it just as an overview, approved it. And now there's a challenge to that on the basis that there wasn't proper uh, consultation. So we don't know where this case is going to go. The province has filed materials with it. And uh, I've not seen those materials, but I understand from, uh, from the province that um, there may be a move here to start to shift that duty down to municipalities. So we'll wait to see what comes out of that case and what happens. If you look at the new provincial policy statement that just came out, it will be in effect at the end of April, April 30th. I think it came out within the last four weeks. Um, there are some sections in there about duties to consult uh, for municipalities. So it looks like there's this trend almost to start to move it that way. Um, how far it will go, I don't know. But I would watch that case very closely because that will really uh, impact municipalities in terms of how they are doing some of their business in some areas. Uh, the City of Ottawa and the Ottawa Home Builders Association uh, is a divisional court case, but it came out of an OMB case. Uh, and it was about an infill uh, bylaw and policies with respect to uh, infill development in established a downtown uh, urban area of the city. And it gave some guidelines for low rise housing infill. And the board looked at this case and 
uh, sent it back, some of it back to the city to uh, make some revisions and redo some of its processes and come back with an amended bylaw. Uh, and at which point I think what you're going to see flowing out of that perhaps might be more litigation before the board and possibly more litigation up to the courts. And really what this case is, is about is the authority of a municipality to adopt a zoning bylaw that is aesthetic in intent. So in other words, not so much what it's used for, but what it looks like. And, and so it raises a lot of interesting issues and, uh, and very, very good arguments if you're interested in, in that perspective. I know often uh, when I'm traveling to other cities and I have planning tours in other cities, the common thing you often hear is that some people don't necessarily object to the use, but they certainly do object to how it looks. And in some places, uh, depending on the type of zoning that they use, um, uses that might not normally go together or live harmoniously based on, on the fact that uh, it's just the, the, the look or the design of it and how it fits into the neighborhood. So it'll be interesting to see where that case goes and I would watch that if you're interested in planning law. Uh, the next one is the Regional Municipality of Waterloo uh, and uh, some of the respondents in this court application include the ministry and uh, some of the developers. And this rose out of uh, an OMB decision on a regional official plan amendment. Uh, and I think I gave you the uh, site for the uh, OMB decision in the, in the handout there as well. So the case at, that, uh, at the OMB level was really about a land budget. And, and the issue was how much land was going to be needed to accommodate growth in the, in the region up to the year 2031. So the Waterloo uh, planners had calculated and uh, put policies up for 85 hectares of land uh, with most, most of the growth being in the built-up areas and some in some of the greenfield areas. Uh, the OMB accepted the evidence of the development community at the hearing and, and uh, their calculation uh, was 1,053 hectares. So we're a long ways apart here. That's a lot of land. Um, this, uh, there's a judicial review that's been launched by Waterloo and the review is not based uh, so much on the merits of the case but rather uh, on rules of natural justice. I can see all the students going back to our rule of law discussion. Um, and in this case there's an allegation that there was a breach of uh, natural justice because the adjudicators had a reasonable apprehension of bias. And so what happened, or is alleged to have happened, is, is that there was a witness who testified before the board, uh, provided modeling with respect to land budgets and how much land would be needed. Uh, that witness, prior to the hearing, a few weeks prior to the hearing, had attended a training session and provided some trainings to municipal board members on the same topic and presented the same model. And so the, uh, the question is whether or not the adjudicator was biased, having heard that and then heard this case. And so that's before the courts and we don't really know where it's going to go. Um, it, it'll be an interesting case, case because, you know, courts do give deference to the OMB decisions in many instances because it interprets its home statute, which is the Planning Act, and also because it does have expertise uh, in that area. So uh, some are watching that very carefully. Um, the last case that I think is interesting, I, I don't know how to pronounce this, so I do apologize if I've done this wrong. Um, it's Tanu Jaja and the uh, Attorney General of Canada. Um, this is not a municipal case. It's one that, that was uh, uh, as against the federal and provincial governments. But I pulled it out because it just got me thinking. Um, how does this case apply to municipal powers? Uh, I think the question is, is there an obligation for municipalities to use their powers that they have? these broad powers to protect uh, uh, either code protected or, or charter or rights and rights afforded to groups that are code protected or protected by the charter. So this case was about affordable housing and, and just shortly whether or not section 7 of the charter imposes a positive obligation on the governments to uh, protect life, liberty or security of the person by providing affordable housing. And in short the court says no. Um, that they, it's, it's a very, very well written decision. It's written by Justice Letter, Letterer, who, by the way, was a municipal lawyer in Toronto before being appointed to, to the bench. 
Um, and the court basically says the application was misconceived, that this is not the courtroom's not the place where you have this type of a discussion or to resolve these types of policy-based issues. There's no freestanding right to affordable housing, and um, uh, the charter does nothing to provide assurance that we all share a right to minimum standard of living. Any uh, application built on the premise that the charter imposes such right cannot succeed and is misconceived. So I, I thought that was interesting. It's apparently under appeal. I looked it up the other day and didn't see any decision yet, so I don't know where, where it is in the mill. In terms of legislative on the horizon, we're, we'll see some Planning Act amendments, uh, um, possibly uh, before the summer, as I understand. Um, and new provincial initiatives, uh, maybe something on the uh, Development Charges Act. Uh, I'm hoping that we get something more if there are going to be some changes than perhaps maybe what we got out of Bill uh, 51. Um, my, my personal view on Bill 51 is that uh, I think myself and others were expecting something more from it. Uh, and really what we see with Bill 51 is, is that it does just codify the existing practices before the uh, OMB. And really the whole notion about the test, you know, have regard to, be consistent with, conform to. The introduction of the words have regard to have been interpreted uh, by uh, a series of decisions, one in Keswick, the train in Weir, which is on your list, and also the Ottawa Mento case. And really the, what but the test for have regard to, um, it just does nothing more than suggest minimal deference to the decisions of municipal council. And uh, flowing from that, that the board just has an obligation to at least scrutinize and carefully consider the decision as well as the information before the council. But it's, it suggests nothing more than minimal deference. Um, if you read the dissent in, in Minto, uh, it's written by Justice Matlow. And he takes a different view of what he thought the amendments to Bill 51 uh, were meant uh, to do. It's a dissenting opinion. It's not binding. This case didn't go up to the Court of Appeals, so we're left with Minto as it is. Um, but he really is of the view that the OMB uh, by Bill 51 should have been transformed to more of an appellant uh, uh, body that really just re did a review of the decisions rather than the de novo, the new hearing process. And we didn't get that. Uh, I, don't, I understand that that's not part of the discussions uh, uh, that are taking place for the uh, Planning Act amendments right now, but uh, I just threw it out there because I'd like to talk about that. <laughs> Growing pains, uh, very quickly as I'm running out of time here, on accountability and transparency, I think we're seeing a lot of growing pains in this section uh, um, and, and those provisions in the Act. Uh, on the Conflict of Interest Act, uh, in 2013 there were six cases under this uh, piece of legislation, uh, two of which were not contested. And so, because you are the political scientists, my question to you is, what does this demonstrate? <laughs> uh, and I think these are some good questions for you as the policy people and the research specialists. Um, is there a need for clarity or certainty uh, under this legislation, or are counselors now more often than not looking for clarity before they, they act? Are the transactions that governments are undertaking more complex because of these broad powers, and hence why we see conflicts emerge more? There's a, there's a, there's one of the things law firms are noticing right now is the bigger they get, the harder it is sometimes to manage conflicts. And that they still are able to do it, but it's a little bit trickier than when they were smaller in size. Are counselors performing a broader or more complex role or function? Uh, is there just too much at risk in the legislation that you'll lose your seat if you do the wrong thing or you don't comply? Uh, is there an interest, uh, more interest in accountability through the public? Uh, is there a decline in ethics or an understanding of ethics? Decline in civility, perhaps. I don't know. Is legislative reform in order? Uh, uh, I think if you look at the Cunningham inquiry coming out of Mississauga, there were certainly some very good recommendations in that. Have we waited too long post Cunningham to bring those uh, into force? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, would we see uh, more applications if there was a less costly way to deal with these rather than having to have a private elector bring it forward uh, to the courts? Um, 
What if there was another type of process, perhaps a tribunal or maybe a provincial officer of some sort that could review these matters and, get, and uh, give direction? Um, I think these are questions for you um, much more than for us. Um, but one of the more interesting cases was the one in, Auto, in Waterloo. Uh, the development of their light rapid uh, rail system uh, is a very big project, significant, extremely important for, for the region and the municipalities. But because of the size and the scope of it, one of the issues that came out of that was that all the conflicts that could potentially arise for members on council who have to make those decisions. And whether you're starting to remove too many people from the decision-making forum on what effectively could be one of the most significant uh, decisions made by the region, certainly one of the most expensive ones uh, in the next decade. And so I think those things, we need to go back to Cunningham. I think we need to get to that, that uh, quickly and have a look at that and get some of those things resolved. In terms of closed meetings, um, since 2008, uh, the implementation of the closed meeting investigators um, we've, uh, we've seen many investigations. Some have been more public than others, as we know. Uh, we've seen compliance with the Act and procedure bylaws. We've seen non-compliance, and we've seen recommendations or improvements made by various uh, closed meeting investigators uh, to council procedures and processes, and just to you know bring people a little bit more into conformity. What we don't know in terms of policy matters about these closed meeting investigations is, uh, you know, performance measures, whether or not there has been an increased compliance with the Act and procedure bylaws, and really whether there has been an increase in, an, in accountability as a result of these, these investigations or the power that now allows people to complain and, and have an investigation undertaken. I don't know whether, I also as well, whether there's been an increased uh, public awareness of the issue of councils meeting behind closed doors or not, whether there has been a significant public benefit to this process or not, and really what the cost has been. So again, those are performance type measures that uh, might make for an interesting uh, paper or a study for uh, someone looking at it in that area. Legal matters, I think the legal issues are that we're still really waiting to see fall out of this is, is it possible that a finding of non-compliance with either a procedure bylaw or the Act by a closed meeting investigator will taint the legality of a bylaw? So in the RSJ Holdings case, the result was that the bylaw of the municipality was quashed. It's of no force and effect. That's a pretty uh, big remedy. Uh, in the Kingston and the Farber case, I gave you the site for that, um, the court did not quash the bylaw. So it, it's clear that when something hasn't been complied with procedurally, the courts are going to look at this. Kingston was a different set of facts. They'd actually had a little more public debate about it, uh, and, and the court felt that that uh, was almost curative in terms of the procedural irregularity, and therefore it was okay. So just because something did not comply with the procedure by law and does not comply with Section 239 may not always invalidate the action. And we haven't seen a case where there's been a finding that there's been a closed meeting or that did not comply with the bylaw or did not comply with the act, and then subsequent, subsequently how that investigation is used in the court application. Uh, what we have seen in the Deltor and Branford case, though, is just some insight, perhaps, that, it, it's a, that there might be something more to these meetings. There's no requirement that if you want to quash a bylaw, you have to go and have a closed meeting investigation. But the Deltor case, the Branford case, it was the case about the Branford bylaws that had been passed uh, in response to the Haudenosaunee uh, actions to set up their development institute and require developers in Brantford to pay development fees to them and in order to uh, develop their lands. And uh, council put up two bylaws prohibiting uh, these types of actions. They debated, uh, they discussed them in closed session. Uh, they had the Brantford police in the closed session as well. They were given legal advice on these bylaws. They came out of the closed session, debated the bylaws, and passed them. And the Haudenosaunee sought to have those bylaws quashed. And 
The court makes particular note, uh, the bylaws are upheld, but with respect to closed meetings, it makes particular uh, notice of the fact that the Haudenosaunee, although they were trying to strike the bylaws because they said they were discussed improperly at the closed meeting, they never asked for a closed meeting investigation under 239.1. So whether that's fact specific on that case, whether that sets a requirement that you have to do that now before you go to court, and then I suppose the next step is what's the effect of that investigation? I don't know. So we're waiting to see where that lands uh, at some point. Other thing with closed meetings is, is the test has been enunciated by some closed meeting investigators correct in law. Uh, if you look at the uh, Ombudsman's website uh, on the London report in the back room, there's a legal opinion uh, where lawyers uh, who participated in the investigation uh, indicate that they feel the test that the Ombudsman applies is too broad. So again, we haven't really settled that yet. Uh, there's some interesting footage uh, on Sudbury's website, a video from 2011 where the Ombudsman uh, attends at the Sudbury City Council to discuss the interview is, among other things, an interview is right to counsel. Um, that, that's quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, the whole notion of powers to sanction, uh, I don't think that's been really settled. And it, you have to remember under 239, the closed meeting investigator's power is to investigate the council. It's not to investigate individual counselors. So this notion about how you might want to sanction individuals for not having done something, the question becomes whether the closed meeting investigator really has jurisdiction for that. Um, I think with the other integrity schemes that are set pl in, in play uh, in the municipal act, that's probably something that it appears the legislature contemplated would be dealt with through another way, through a code of conduct or something uh, instead. Um, but again, we don't know that. Uh, is it realistic for all municipal council business to be done on the council floor? Supreme Court of Canada seemed to think that a lot of it needs to be done there if you read RSJ, but is that really a realistic way for government to operate? If you push the open meetings rule too far, will municipalities uh, use their delegation powers to the extent possible to remove things and therefore reduce accountability? I don't know. Um, do the open meeting rules effectively prohibit political parties? Uh, in, in Ontario. Looks like it'd be rather difficult if you were the majority uh, on the committee or the council from having like a caucus meeting, for instance, something to that effect. And does the open rule me uh, open uh, meetings rule interfere with just normal lobbying efforts as well, lobbying people on municipal issues, which is really an important part of the government process as we have it. Uh, quickly, uh, again, as I'm, I'm running out of time, I'm looking at the clock here, but oh, I have too much to say. Um, so, so we will talk quickly about Ford and Magder, um, but uh, we'll, we'll hopefully talk about it in, the, in a different context than maybe we, we've uh, been hearing about it. I have a mentor, and when you ask him, how are you, he says to me, oh, I'm in the usual state of confusion. And some of us feel that after Ford and Magder, we are left in the usual state of, of confusion. Um, the case does demonstrate two important policy points for you. There's lots of legal issues in that, but I think for, for your, your years and your purpose, um, the M conflict of interest and code of conduct matters are, appear to be a, a little bit on a collision course in terms of how they're to be handled. And I think we need to have a closer look at Justice Cunningham's advice for legislative reform, and that's demonstrated in this case. And the second is, is that the power of a council to impose a remedial remedy beyond what's in the statute, uh, a penalty beyond what's in the statute, um, I, I'm, it's still, I don't think, very clear. So the Conflict of Interest Act and the Code of Conduct matters, um, looking at Justice Cunningham's advice for legislative reform, uh, there, there's a rule of law that when, you, when there's a case being made against you, you have the right to be heard. Pretty fair. Okay, and some of these things in law are, aren't that difficult. We learn them at a very young age, and so there it is. So when the council is looking to impose a penalty on a councillor under the code of conduct and under the municipal act, the question becomes, what can the council member do? Can they speak about it? And that's where the collision is with the Conflict of Interest Act, because if they're going to put a fine of some sort on or a penalty, then that has the pecuniary interest, and the two 
pieces of legislation don't quite fit together very well. And that comes out of the Magner case. We see that right there. And so Justice Cunningham did make that uh, recommendation for an amendment to recognize the right for the counselor to speak in those instances, but that hasn't been done. And in the, the Magner case, the court very clearly says, we don't have that power to fix that, and they don't. So the second is the power of the council to impose a remedial measure beyond what, what's in the legislation. So the penalties are the reprimand or the suspension of uh, their remuneration or the council pay. So uh, it isn't quite clear in my view what you can do. Um, the court says that the broad powers under the Municipal Act support the validity of including some other kind of remedial measure, maybe like an apology or something. But where they leave us is, but we, they say, we need not determine the precise ambit of what's a permissible remedial measure. So in other words, we don't know. So we wait till the next case. Uh, what are they? Um, an objectionable re remedial measure uh, is one that's for a punitive purpose. Um, repayment of money was a, was a penalty and not remedial. And so it's not really clear from the act where you can go with that. Uh, and uh, in this case, there's, there are findings of fact, so it's fact specific. And the next case that comes up through the, the system, it'll be decided again on those facts. Maybe we might get a bit more guidance at that point as to what's committed. So I'm done, and I will take some questions. I'm so sorry I've gone so long. There's lots of other cases I wanted to talk about, but I'm hoping that just gives you something to think about over a sandwich and maybe room uh, for the rest of your afternoon. And uh, thanks very much to uh, uh, Martin and uh, Josh for inviting me. So I don't know if you have any questions or... Um, you know, we have, well, it's 12.40 and we officially end at 12.45, but we can, I think we can go until 12.50 if people can stay uh, because we just need to be out of here for a 1 o'clock use of the room. Uh, so that would give us about 10 minutes for questions. And I, I mean, uh, Jen, you put so many different things on the table. I'm sure people have a variety of questions. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so let's, let's hear from some folks. Yeah, I just kind of have a question, I guess, about Policy. Um, you talked about it in the context of what was going on in Ottawa, but I'm just wondering, I guess, what kind of the legal perspective is in regards to selling service industrial land below cost and how that kind of aligns or doesn't with the bonusing provisions that yeah. are being applied. Well, I think generally what what the uh, what the Ottawa case says, and, and it does confirm some of the uh, other other decisions, is is simply that when you're going to do something, um, you have to make sure that you're not granting this obvious advantage. And so if you are if you are selling something below market or leasing something below market or providing some kind of assistance as provided in the municipal law, then there needs to be it needs to be clear that it's not an obvious advantage. And one of the ways that you can make it not be an obvious advantage is to be looking for what other benefits uh, might arise from that. So in those types of arrangements, the, the question is whether or not th there is a concomitant that benefit to the municipality uh, that is completing the transaction. And, and in some instances, those, those transactions will be structured with maybe some other type of arrangement. There might be some, uh, uh, some things that the, the that the developer uh, or the proponent has to do as part of the deal. So if you just look at the dollar value of the land deal and say, well, that's below fair market value, Ottawa says, no, you got to look at the whole transaction altogether and what's coming with it as part of the package. So on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, you'd look at that. Yeah, a very quick supplementary on that. Was gonna... Yeah. A, a benefit would not be jobs for residents of the municipality, right? Um, I'm not so sure that I'm aware of a case on that. So I, I think the question, um, uh, when you looked at um, the, the NOAC case, which was the one in Fort Erie uh, down there, was a, a, a waterfront property, I think. And there were an, uh, it was a portion of land that was being, I think, leased or sold out for, for a certain value. And so. Um, they, they might look at they might look at other things besides 
besides just that. I'm not aware. I'm not aware of a case where somebody says this will give you X hundred jobs, and therefore that is not a bonus. Because normally those types of things are all rolled into a package where there's some give and take and sharing of the risk. Land municipality wants to have developed. They want some kind of facility, perhaps that comes with it, etc. Okay. So yeah. It would be an interesting case, I think. Yeah. Um, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I'll go right back to the beginning of what you were talking about and uh, the broad powers conception and this idea of valid municipal purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would be interested in your take on the extent to which it seems that valid municipal purposes are geographically as opposed to jurisdictionally defined because the example we were talking about uh, you know the logic was one of localized geographical impact mm -hmm. um, which would suggest for example and I don't think this has been tested in Ontario correct me if I'm wrong that a, that an Ontario municipality would for example have the right to impose a municipal minimum wage if it you know was shown that it would be um, you know in, in the interest of the particular conditions of the local population mm -hmm. but of course that's a matter of you know, it, that could potentially be construed as infringing on the provincial jurisdiction and labor law. So, yeah. so, so is this, you know, is it a geographical or a jurisdictional definition? Um, uh, I, I, I think I, I think it goes more to what what we in law would say is the you know is the pith and substance of it. And and so if you were to just say it jurisdictional, mm -hmm. there are rules. Maybe that's in, not in a valid. Yeah, yeah, like um, the, yeah. The, 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 mm -hmm. There are rules in the municipal act that that say when you can. That, that, that deal with, with how uh, municipal governments can regulate into other fields that are occupied by either the provincial or the federal government. But um, I, I think it's, it's demonstrating that there is some purpose. And, and the problem with the Toronto case was that they weren't really able to show that that, that issue was a, an issue for Toronto residents. So there might have, yeah, there might have been another way perhaps if if the if the product had some harmful health effects uh, and they were able to demonstrate that I know they did argue that in that case but it, it didn't carry enough weight to, to, to take the, the bylaw through but that might be you know a different answer so I, I don't know that it would necessarily be restricted geographic geographically I mean there are some things that municipalities regulate that that affect all other municipalities as well um, some choose to regulate and, and some don't that answers your question, but I, I think it's 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 really looking at the pith and substance of what it is, and, and what the impact is, is is for for the the municipality. So um, you know, there just has to be um, there has to be something more than just it, it's desirable that we want to do this. It has to relate somehow to the well-being, socio-economic well-being uh, of the of the municipality in some respect, tying it together with all the other parts. Of the municipality, yeah. not like not of people outside. The municipality. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I do have one more question. Sure. The Waterloo case, where you said there was the uh, person doing the training, and uh, yeah. I, I thought the problem with the Waterloo uh, case was that the Waterloo planners were really trying to, uh, and the Waterloo Council were trying to abide by the provincial regulations on places to grow, and the developers wanted to yeah. break that, and the OMB said to hell with the provincial uh, uh, rules. I thought that was the important part. Yeah. Well, it, it, it is. It, it is. I, I just chose to, to mention that, that one aspect. I mean, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But why, yeah. why, why doesn't somebody argue uh, that um, the OMB shouldn't be violating uh, uh, declared provincial policy? Yeah. And, and, and I think that's what's sort of working its, its way through the, through the process now. I, I think that, the, you know, the Minto case kind of... It, it, you know, one of the problems is is that I, I think there was there some people felt that there was an expectation coming out of Bill 51 that we might get something different in terms of the deference that would be provided to councils. But this but we don't see councils. This is deference no. to the provincial government. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They put OMB yeah. says they're they're and the growth, superior to the provincial yeah, government and, and and the growth plan and yeah. the, the growth plan legislation and really whether or not we should be interpreting 
how we should be interpreting the growth plan legislation. No, I agree with you that that's, that's a key in that case. I chose just to put one perspective of the of the case in, in front because uh, I know it's, it's caused uh, some interest uh, around the province with respect to that. So we'll see where it goes. I don't know where it's going to go. And yeah. May I just <laughs> briefly yeah. on this? I, and yeah. I, I, I just, my understanding yeah. is that uh, part of why that <coughs> hasn't been emphasized so far is that uh, that it is not clear that um, the OMB violated the growth plan guidelines because it's a matter of the methodology that you use to forecast growth needs. And and the argument is that you know they've used different methodologies and arrived at different results, but they both are within the parameters of the the legislation, and it's a methodological question. I mean that's. I've been told that. And then we were in big trouble with places to grow. Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, it's, I'm not saying it's not an issue. I'm saying I think that's why yeah. it hasn't been emphasized yeah. so far in the, in the legal perspective. Planners are certainly looking at it from from that perspective. With, with some are, with without a doubt, in terms of that. If this is what we got with places to grow, is this is this where we wanted it to go? And you know, I I think uh, under the Minto Act, some people felt under the Minto case, some people really felt that Bill 51 was just to codify what the existing system was. But some people thought it was supposed to be something new, and it wasn't. So, you know, maybe this is another example of where we we were hoping the legislation was going to take us somewhere, but maybe it's not. But and I think you've got a good point. The places to grow wasn't yeah. relevant. In the mental case, because no, 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 no. But it's it's the principle of it, right? It's it's the principle of it, right? You bring something in, and you you hope that it's going to accomplish something. And the question is, you've raised it, has it? Have we? Is that is that meeting the intent of the legislation? And I think that's that's the question that the other question that comes out of the Waterloo case. And I agree. Yeah, I just chose one aspect to, to show to you. Yeah. So maybe time for one more question if there's somebody. Uh, do we have anybody online asking a question, Josh? No, no one's asking a question okay. right now. Uh, yeah, there, there are people there. there. Um, well, in that case, uh, Jen, thank you again very much for showing us, among other things, just how much is going on on the musical law front. Right? I mean, there's so many, so many different fronts that you've, uh, you've introduced for us to think about. So, so thank you, and um, thanks to everybody for coming, and we'll see you Next month, I hope. Uh, we next month we've got Dan Hanstra coming. Um, Dan's going to be talking about emergency management issues for municipal events. So, thank you.